All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode six of I Don't Give a Flick. I'm your host, Johnny Blackburn. Along here with me is my co-host, Gary Elmore. Welcome back, Gary. I'm glad you could join us Good again. Good to be here, Johnny. I, Thank I, you. I know it's really difficult uh, trek for you to get here it, normally. It, it is. I have to... To your own kitchen. Yeah, I have to climb the Himalayas and... Wow. Uh, yeah, hire a Sherpa. <laughs> yeah. And, Gotta uh, hire a Sherpa? Yeah. Okay. Thankfully, the weather's nice, you know, so it's not too cold up there, but, you know... I, you know, I've never, I've, I've never met anybody who... Was a Sherpa, claimed to be a Sherpa, or had used a Sherpa as a guide? Well, there is a Sherpa I've, shortage going on in the world right is now. Is there? Yes. I could see that with COVID-19. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So That's a tongue twister. It, say it, it five it, times fast. See what yeah. happens. If you have a desire to be a Sherpa, please sign up at ZipRecruiter.com. Is this a real? Th- you're making this up. You're making it up. Okay. I, making I, it up. I mean, I, you had me going for a second. Yeah, I was I, like, I how appreciate the that. hell do you know that? Yes. www.ziprecruiter.com slash Sherpa jobs now. Perfect. Yes. That's, I'm so happy to know that. I've also never met anybody that was a shepherd. Yeah. You could be or, a Sherpa shepherd if you wanted to. Is that a thing? Yeah. You heard the, the sheep up the, the mountain. Up the mountain, I guess. Yeah. Up, yeah. For a tour? Up, yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, higher altitude makes their uh, um, fleece more airy and uh, lighter. Yeah. I don't care about this Yeah. Anymore. It's called Himalayan I'm fleece. On. Okay. Uh, guys, welcome back to I Don't Give a Flick. Like I said, episode six, where the debates are hotter than Stacy's mom and the knowledge is more pertinent to your existence than the invention of the human wheel and sliced bread. Joining us on today's podcast, we have my friend uh, Jacob Johnson, host of the podcast Reese and Jacob versus Evil. Jacob, welcome. Hello. I'm thankful that I now know the name of this podcast that I'm on. I I know. You, uh, I thought, maybe I hadn't told you. Maybe I actually, you know, that might have been my fault. I should have, I should have texted you the name. It's very possible. And also, you've never, you've never met a shepherd? Not in my entire life. I've met ranchers and farmers plenty of times. Well, all right. Well, this just to let it, just to let you know if you, if you didn't have any pre-existing knowledge, this uh, this is a a very uh, we use explicit language on this podcast, and there's a lot of spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movies we're uh, going over today, that's your own damn fault. Go watch the movies. Of course, we're going to be talking about movies starting from the early 1900s all the way up to now. I so mean, it is a lot of movies it's, to watch. Yeah, th- there are, and we're we're gonna you know we're not gonna go through all of them, obviously. So but, Johnny, uh, what what kind of movies are we talking about today? <laughs> what we're gonna be going over today is the uh, progress of science fiction in the film industry from its inception with the first movie considered to be the first sci-fi movie ever made with A Trip to the Moon Ooh. in 1902 all the way up until present day. So uh, let's look at a little background about our uh, our guest today, uh, Jacob, uh, a recent Jacob versus Evil. I was able to listen to uh, one of the podcasts that you sent me a couple weeks ago, uh, did enjoy it, and so it, it looks to me like you guys do mostly film reviews. Is that correct or am I a little off? Yes, mostly uh, we're just covering like what have we come across either on Netflix, Shutter, Amazon Prime, or anything recent, uh, and we'll just do a quick review of that movie. Um, we s- sort of start off talking about like things we've watched uh, since we kind of started it during quarantine, uh, things we've watched since then, uh, video games we've played, uh, or more recently trying to just uh, d- uh, talk strictly about horror when it comes to those things because we did go on okay. a whole tangent about uh some reality trash tv like too hot to handle last week and it went on a little <laughs> too long oh my god uh <laughs> were you able to keep up with the kardashians that one oh. i did not watch great okay. one gary yeah no you know, problem i i watched the the newest uh netflix one uh love is blind with my Love girlfriend is blind. the other week. Yep. And I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. I liked it. I, I watched all the way up through the, the reunion interview, and I was hooked. And I'm not afraid to admit that. So, Gary, what be. do you think about that? Yeah? Uh, yeah. I have no idea what Love is Blind is about, though. Uh, Gary, it's where they have a bunch of single people uh-huh. who go into pods, essentially, and there's a wall in between them, and there's two rooms, one on each side, and they talk to each other. They don't get to see what the other person looks like. They just talk to them for up to 10 days, and then they decide if they've fallen in love or not, and then they ask the other person on the other side of the wall to marry them without have ever seen them. Are you kidding me? No, I'm being serious. And so they don't get to see each other until after the proposal is accepted. And then after that, they have to go on a week-long vacation. Then they get to live together for a couple weeks. And a month after they propose, they actually uh, get married. Or they, they get to the altar and see if anybody will last. So I think uh, two, two couples from the last season actually got married. One of the couples is still dating, and the other one split up. So, What an absolutely ridiculous thing to have I'm, happen. I'm not going to lie. It, it yep. was, I, 
so Jacob, you said you've seen it. I mean, did you just oh, watch yeah. it for your podcast, or you just watched it because you do enjoy trash reality TV? Oh, I, I enjoyed trash reality TV mostly because it I, was I, on I, Netflix, and it was just like. You what know, else are you going to do right now? Just obnoxiously throwing it in my face, like you should watch this. Kind of with the circle. I don't know if you watch the circle at all. Oh God, there's not the Tom the Tom Hanks one with Emma Watson. <laughs> no, yes. no, not the movie. Oh. The, there's oh. a show where basically it's all about oh. uh, okay. how how much they could influence each other within a building without ever actually seeing each other. Okay. Uh, so it's all through like uh, you know just like text messages and like different messages and stuff and just seeing who in the house would actually uh you know vote for that those people over the others uh so it's just okay. a giant influencer show i think it's my favorite of the three it definitely has more redeemable human beings in it uh love is blind is like a step down from it i mean obviously you do have like some people in there like specifically jessica and uh i forgot who her fiance was in love is blind but mark Mark, yeah, like yeah. Jessica was the worst, but Mark. Gary, shut the fuck up! <laughs> See, this is, I, this I'm going to punch a man in the side. I'm going to punch my co-host in the side of the head. His name shut up, Mark. Gary. He's a great guy. No, Jenny Jones was the best talk show in the '90s. It was better than Jerry Springer, and Fifth Wheel and Eliminate were my two favorite shows. So I did. Fuck you, Trash good. Reality TV is awesome. Yeah. Okay, Johnny. And then okay. Too hot to handle, Johnny. You need to watch Too Hot to Handle. I need your opinion on that. Too show. hot to handle. All right. Is that a cooking show? No, Gary. It's not a cooking show. Oh, I hate Gary so much. What Why is are it? we doing this? What, podcast what kind of together? show? Is it a sci-fi show? Does it have anything related to this topic? <laughs> this topic. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people on there are robots. Oh, well, that's kind of neat. Jeez. All right. Well, I definitely have to watch it now. All right. Uh, hashtag watching next week. Yes. Hashtag. I'm hashtagging it. So, it's so actually, I, uh, so Johnny and I watched this show called Idiocracy, um, which is a <laughs> uh, Mike Judge show. And uh, listening to these uh, reality TV shows you guys are talking about, I really think uh, we're doing a great job moving in that direction quickly. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's no, There's nothing better than sitting down with the nice Mountain Dew while mm. watching uh, Too Odd to Handle. Yeah, I mean, wasn't the like uh, the guy was watching a porno where the woman was like cutting up a steak with her feet or something in what? in Idiocracy? Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, <laughs> and like, yeah, I think we're we're getting I mean, there the quickly. Top, the top show. I mean, I would say that. The, I mean, the top show in the Idiocracy universe at that time was Ow My Balls. Yep. Yeah. So I'm say that you know I'd say Love Is Blind and Too Hot to Handle yeah. are on the same. I'd say we're about eighty five percent. Definitely. We're, we're, there. we're close. Yeah, yeah we're, close we're getting to there. there. Absolutely. Good job, humanity. <laughs> We're All right, great. moving on. Uh, so I, I, let's 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 preface this. Let, let let's preface this a little bit with science fiction. I mean, obviously, everybody listening probably knows a fair amount. You know, you know the you know the classic, the Star Wars, the Back to the Futures, the Terminators, the the Matrix series. You know the you know the classic blockbuster uh, series, but. I can't think of any other, and I was talking to Gary about this outside earlier, I don't can't think of any other genre that boasts such a large level of cult following like sci-fi, like like mm-hmm. that genre genre. You don't see this as much with, you don't see it as much with actions or, or co- the comedy genre or rom-com or right. mystery or uh, psychological yeah. thriller or anything. Yeah, I, I Horror, don't see, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't but, see people lining up outside of the movie theaters to go watch the next Sherlock Holmes movie. You know, it's true, I suppose. Uh, but you know, you do for uh, science fiction films a lot of the time. Absolutely. You know, I mean, you, you have your you have your Trekkies. You have your um, what what would be the name for Star Wars nerds or you know avid fans? Star, Star Wars nerds. I think are they yeah. Star Wars nerds. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I mean, we would fall in. I mean, I think probably amongst three of us, we'd probably somewhat fall into that category as well. Um, less well, and less as time goes on. That's right. <laughs> We're getting closer and closer to some of those movies being realistic. Who knows. Maybe not in our lifetime, but no. I mean, I, I think that with with films like that, it, it it gives people. It's like the fantasy genre, you know. It, it gives people even more of an escape from their own reality mm-hmm. yeah. than just the average. Here's here's a script based on everyday life or some amazing story that a human being has been a part of, and and you know, here get lost in this. Yeah, you know, and I I think people like um, sci-fi more than fantasy because it's got. A little bit more of a, a realistic element to it, you know. People like thinking about the future and things that can kind of happen in the future. Places we could be, places okay, we yeah, could be, uh, situations that could happen. Uh, then, because I mean, you, like fantasy. I mean, you think about like Lord of the Rings. 
Uh, that was the first movie that popped in my head was Return of the King, actually. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, and it's just, it's it's a different type than like, you know, an Aliens, because Lord of the Rings is, it's a world that doesn't exist. Aliens is a world that could exist. Right, right. Now, Jacob, I mean, when, <clears throat> so to preface, Jacob and I used to work together um, a while back, and, you know, we used to, we used to talk, our big thing was, you know, to outside of new releases was the Marvel movies. You know, we were working together when um, yeah. the Infi- you know, the Infinity War movies were coming out and the final Captain America. And, I remember and living movies. through the Infinity War. Huh? I remember living through the Infinity War. Yeah, do That you? was tough, yeah. I don't remember because I disappeared for five years. Yeah, I know. So it was a wonderful a five years. from it? Yeah, I do. I do. In fact, I was just in a support group with Steve Rogers, so it was pretty, pretty impactful. Um, but, I mean, yeah, no, one of the things that, you know... Jacob, uh, they, we used to talk about was um, outside of horror films was was sci-fi being a big one. So wh- why is sci-fi one of your favorite genres? What what have you always loved about it? You know, since you were a kid or nowadays or whatever. It kind of encompasses like all feelings. Like it, it encompasses hope for what could be. Like the optimism behind like some of the more incredible sci-fi experiences. Like what our planet could be, what our race could be, or the human race. Uh, uh, where we could go, how far we could go, um, the abilities to sort of touch God, as it were. Um, and then also it kind of bring, like even shows us the darker sides of that. It shows us the dystopian uh, mm. landscapes, the post-apocalyptic landscapes. It shows us like our darkest natures, our darkest desires. Uh, so it kind of encompasses everything. While, while there is like dark fantasy, Game of Thrones, Berserk, stuff like that. Uh, but most of the time, fantasy is very optimistic and hopeful. There's very much a a quintessential good and evil, while sci-fi is very much skewered. Uh, a lot of the heroes in sci-fi are kind of fallible. They're corruptible. Uh, and, yeah, that's pretty much why I love it. And it's just, like, full of monsters. It's just full of, like, wild ideas, wild creations. Um, and it just goes places that fantasy could go, but science fiction goes further than that sure absolutely I, and i think that you know with what the cool thing about it like outside of sci-fi always leading the way typically over you know the long decades it's been around in the special effects department you know it's typically a vehicle for social commentary and yeah. things of that nature and whatnot um so i do want to i do kind of want to start at the beginning um from what our research showed that uh the movie uh, a trip to the moon uh based in 1902 uh, basically, a, a just a group of astronomers, they go on a journey expedition to the moon itself. Um, have have either of you guys actually seen this before? Have you YouTubed it? And yeah, it's, it's a short film. Okay. Uh, Jacob, have you seen it? No, I have not. Uh, okay. Basically, it's a short film about, you know, astronomers going to the moon and the what they find up there. Uh, now, granted, at the time, it was really science fiction because they had no idea is there an atmosphere are there yeah. people up there they're probably still a fair amount of flat earthers uh not as many back then as there, <laughs> as are, now. there are now yeah uh, that's true but yeah so it, you know and it was just it was really interesting to see because they were kind of just trying to figure out what it would be like and they didn't have the advantage of a lot of the knowledge we do nowadays you know 118 years later about what the universe is how it's made up and what kinds of environments you can expect to see um, on those, you know, uh, heavenly bodies. So mm-hmm. they, they go up to the moon and they explore it and, you know, meet the people there and have their encounters with them. And then what I think was really cool about it is it's sort of, as, as Johnny was saying earlier, the first sci-fi movie because it's also one of the really earliest films. It was the first... Now, correct me if I'm wrong, it was the first movie to use stop-motion graphics and animation. Is that correct? I, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I remember there was there was a movie, actually the movie that I, uh, we did a <clears throat> episode last week about our most, uh, our we, our best directors of all time, Martin Scorsese was mine. He did that movie that I was telling you about. Um, Hugo. Oh, Hugo, yes. Loved Hugo. Such, I mean, he, knocking it out of the park, you know, first at bat for a child's film. Anyways, they, they basically, they didn't parody the making of that film, but Ben Kingsley's character was supposedly supposed to be the creator of a, a trip to the moon or they did their version of it. Mm. Um, okay. And so that was, you know, that was my only, yeah. And, and I think like you yeah, get a lot of that exposure to it as well. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get a lot of influence from like Jules Verne who, you know, mm-hmm. was writing, um, 
20,000 yeah, half, leagues under the Yeah, half a century sea. before, mm-hmm. um, you know, in that sort of I- excitement and the unknown up there. And there, back then there was a lot more unknown than there is today. So I think as these sci-fi films evolve throughout the, the century, and we talk about more of them later on, the later ones, they, they become less of the fantasy element, which is that unknown kind of moving into and more into the... Um, the uh, science fact arena. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess, you know, move, moving past that, because I, I think the next movie that would come up that most people have actually heard of at some point would be probably 1927's uh, Metropolis. Yeah. You know, and at the time, that was the that was the highest, not only the highest gross, one of the highest grossing films, like it's Gone with the Wind, um, but was the most expensive mm-hmm. film to make at that time. So in between, uh, you know, we had things uh, like they, they had a 1916 version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. They had um, I, it, The Lost World they were considering. Um, and I see on some of the lists that we've been reading, I see Frankenstein and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on there. I, I would put those more in the horror genre. Yeah, the, yeah but, not really and, sci-fi. But anyways, moving, moving past that, um, we finally start to see in the 1920s uh, when the studio system, and we go back to our episode where we talked about the 1960s mm-hmm. and the final collapse of the studio system uh, when Congress finally came in and, and split up the distribution and the movie theaters and the studios as all being separate entities and those people could not own all three and monopolize the market. Um, we started to see in the 20s, we started to see some of those movies being made over in Europe mm-hmm. bit by bit, you know. I mean, it was a very small amount, Um so you start to see some of that European, not as cautious when it comes to the type of films they're putting out. Okay. You know, we start to see that influence push forward, and I think we actually saw that in Metropolis. Um, I have I have not seen Metropolis since I was like 11, 10 or eleven. Yeah, so it's been a long. I remember bits and pieces of scenes, but you've yeah, you I've did watch it, it yeah. recently, didn't you? Yeah. Um, and one of the things I'd like to point out with the sci-fi movies is they're really, I think, especially even today, they're really sort of the driving vehicle behind the new technologies that come out for filming movies, the, you know, matte paintings, uh, miniatures, the stop motion. Mm-hmm. Because if, if you look at a drama or, you know, a rom-com, they're not really pushing the boundaries in terms of what, what can we film, you know, what will look good. Um, it's in the sci-fi genre that you have that push for technological advancement in order to tell the story. So, you know, you know, you go from a trip to the moon in 1902 to Metropolis in 1927, and you've really advanced uh, the technology um, in order to to tell a larger story. Right. With that. Well, and they they had you know once the late once the late teens early twenties came around, and you know talking pictures had started to become a thing in the silent era. You know the Charlie Chaplins and such, and started to die down. And our good friend Frederick March, uh, March uh, you know his reign started oh, to happen Frederick in the March. late twenties. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I think yeah. Once those talking the talkies, as they called them, once that was allowed, then you start seeing what you talked about. You start seeing not only them visiting these new places, you start to see them diving into the complexity of how the societies mm-hmm. are structured on those different worlds, or right. those planets, or the future itself, things like that. So, um, for people that aren't familiar with Metropolis, which I'm sure a lot of listeners aren't, um, give us a little background uh, on that. Basically, it's a story about. Um, uh, a robot society and how that society interacts with the humans that live uh, that that they that that society lives in with mm-hmm. and the sort of uh, how a human being interacts with that and the oppressions that come upon the robots and how they get their you know struggle for their freedom. So you, as as Johnny said earlier in the podcast, uh, sci-fi really does a lot of um, talking about the current issues of the day through a, a lens to the future, you know? And I think it makes it easier for people to accept that, of uh-huh. what's going on, if it's based in an era that's not an era they're yeah. living in currently. Yeah. And when we get to the 1960s, we may talk about a, a TV show that also did that a lot. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so moving on, once we finally actually start to get in the 20s, we start to get the storyline, we start to get the social commentary, little by little is being pieced in one part at a time around then. So then we move into the 30s and the 40s. Um, you know, we, we, excuse me, you know, we get into things with uh, movies like The Invisible Man. Um, you know, you, you look at 
Oh, God. Much different than the recent Invisible Man yes, movie that yes, came out. Yes, yes, much. It, <laughs> yes, it's much more of a monster both, movie. Both good movies, yes. but... <laughs> um, you know, and so I know that around around this time, Jacob, you and I had had a conversation about the, um, you know, the, I, I guess this is a little, this is before the gigantic monster scene really exploded. Um, but around around that time, do you recall any films or um, monsters oh, yeah. that kind of stuck out to you within oh, those yeah. decades? King Kong uh, was released in 1933. That's probably the biggest one of okay. that era for mm-hmm. giant monsters and stuff. And so, I mean, obviously, just King Kong in general was hugely influential for the monster genre as well as, like, for special effects at that time. Because right. not only were the stop-motion effects pretty incredible, uh, just even the puppetry and mm-hmm. the actual, like, cr- like Kong himself, they would build, like, these giant um, sort of uh, models for him. And it was okay. pretty awesome. And then just easily one of the greatest monster movies of all time. Uh, and then even going into the universal monsters, I mean, at this time you had, uh, yeah, like you said, Frankenstein, uh, Bride of Frankenstein, even, mm. um, uh, I believe invisible man was at that time. And I mean, yeah, you could, they're, they're horror, but they're also very much influenced by the sci-fi genre as well. They ride the line. Uh, yeah. And then the flash Gordon serials, which are, hugely influential in what would become you know star wars indiana jones right. uh that kind of stuff yeah so if we even so really i mean if you if you want to dig in deeper and start splitting hairs and stuff yeah i mean the sci-fi genre itself really dictated the adventure genre moving forward into the you know the 50s through today i guess even um yeah yeah i, I would agree to that I, uh because sci-fi movies um typically have a lot to do about exploration and it's not even exploration externally. A lot of it's internal exploration, how people react to various situations that they're put in. I mean, you, you can look at alien mm-hmm. and you know, it, it doesn't even matter that they're on a spaceship really, you know, it's how people react to being hunted. Right. Yeah. I so mean, it it's was the same thing whenever uh, Orson Welles had recited war of the world's, over the radio for the very oh first yeah time. oh yeah everyone believed it to actually be happening that aliens from Mars <laughs> were taking over the world and I mean War of the Worlds in itself became a huge uh, influence on sci-fi uh, thanks to H G Wells as well right and it, what was what was so interesting about that was you know at, as a lot of people know you know outside of the outside of the push forward with with the talkies and composition and sound music and all that being included and incorporated into films of that era um you know we're during we're during the great depression during mm-hmm. this point so you see a lot of people are coming to the, they're coming to the theater and they want to see they're not trying to see just one movie for on the cheap. They're trying to see multiple. So a lot of times the studios would do a lot of a uh, quick, low budget type. So stop, stop it. Uh, the stop motion animation mm-hmm. that was really popular because it was not that expensive to do. Um, from what I remember for the King Kong, though, they what you were talking about, Jacob, with the uh, they used uh, uh, like proportionate life size replicas and stuff. Mm-hmm. Basically, they right. would build they have like they would, full on King Kong's hand. While the right, actor would be actually within his hand. Yeah, and they yeah. would use like a smaller lens on the camera to get really low and make it seem like they're shooting the actual Empire State Building, you know, and you see the New York skyline when really, you know, it's a, a five by five game board set with buildings built up out of, you know, yeah. night you know, cheap wood and and glue. Yeah, you know. Paint. And and paint, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um so yeah, so you know, you, you saw that in the threes and the forties just because we had the war going on and stuff. Hollywood was they were god they were popping out so many of these of these these sci-fi thrillers and they were doing them all on the cheap but people ate them up because i mean they mm. needed something to take their mind off not being able to yeah. not being able to yeah. feed their family or you know having to be go to war in europe or you know yeah. in the pacific and uh, it was a tough time so mm. i mean i think in a lot of ways the sci-fi genre itself movies in particular but the sci-fi genre more so really helped probably save the sanity of you know yeah thousands upon millions of people you know i would i would assume and i actually like the uh, the king kong remake by peter jackson it actually kind of captures that sort of uh that great depression as well in the first like 20 minutes or so because it's like okay well, are, 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 are like out of work right um it's right. showing how decadent like that time was 
Yeah, yeah. Are, are you just are you just referring to the style that he made, like the art direction, like the start, the style, like in the the history that he used in the background, or right. the movie? Just as the okay. environmental storytelling that he was showing in the background, as well as like even the uh, main character Anne's struggles in the beginning with her not being able to get work, and then most of the right. actors of that time who were in those stage plays on Broadway and stuff couldn't get work because of the Great Depression. Mostly just right. plotting what Peter Jackson was doing there and showing the Great Depression in. Uh, that film instead of, you know, just kind of like pushing it to the side. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, that's, that's a fantastic point. I, I personally didn't really care for that movie very much outside of the, the fight scene between King Kong and the, uh, the lizard Godzilla. monster yeah. where he like, yeah, he, he crushed his jaw in the all yeah, yeah, but basically, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's, uh, you know, honestly, I'd never even thought about that yeah. portion of it. No, that's, that's a good eye. <laughs> and it, it's interesting too, because King Kong, the story really, you know, seems to be centered around like, you know, you've got to kind of almost have it in that time period because I think in the mm -hmm. late seventies, they made a, another version of King Kong that was modern um, at that time. And so you had King Kong like climbing the world trade centers yeah, and Jeff bridges. Yeah. Jeff bridges. Um, right. And um, you know, it just, that one for whatever reason didn't really hold together, I think as well as the one from the original one, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were yeah. trying. They were trying to. So Jaws, obviously one of the most influential movies as well. Uh, people are trying to cash in on that, and so they built like <clears throat> giant life-size models of like King Kong, and they just did not look good in that '70s version. Uh, mm -hmm. They were just they were just going about that movie the wrong way, um, and then everything from just like the set design and even like the locations. It's like they were just shooting in Hawaii and like you just pointed out and they're like, this is Skull Island. No, that's just Hawaii, man. I, anybody can recognize that. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, so then we, we get on. Uh, well, we after, move in. Yeah. You yeah. know, we move into uh post-war at yeah. that point, you know, after, after 45 there and into the 1950s. And this is it, when sci-fi movies just explode in terms of, popularity and, and the, the, types. the budget that the Hollywood studios could actually use. Yeah. It, it increased by, you know, five to mm. six times. It was just insane. Um, and, and, and what was one of the reasons that, so that yeah, I mean, popular. people were, were freed up and people were also very excited in the fifties, um, you know, and into the sixties about technology and science, um, as people had more money and more time to kind of look at different uh, aspects of their life. So you see a lot more space exploration science fiction. Um, then you have the the worries of the atomic bomb. So that give, leads you into Godzilla and the, the mega monsters like that. Well, yeah, you know, it was funny. We and we we saw during that decade a huge boom in alien films. You yeah. know, that was, you know, the day the Earth says still. And I mean, you had talked about, you know, um, Orson Welles and whatnot. Um and talking, you know, his radio broadcast and stuff. I mean, that obviously a little earlier. But yeah, I mean, just Finally, you know, f during those first couple decades from the early 1900s to, to the 50s, you know, we primarily saw one or two subgenres of sci-fi. Mm -hmm. And then in the 50s, it does explode, like you're saying, right. and all of a sudden we see, you know, fucking s six, six or seven, you know. Yeah, yeah and, a lot of different. Yeah, exactly. Um so I, I mean, you know, you know, for 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 the for the the, the kaiju era, you know, um, Jacob, you were kind of talking about uh, Godzilla and King Kong earlier. So elaborate on that a little bit. What did you uh, what did, what did you love about that? What did you think was so influential about that? How do you think it still influences a lot of those types of monsters, like the the remakes of Godzilla, uh, the Pacific Rim style movies that are being produced today, even? Oh yeah. Uh, so growing up, I was a huge Godzilla fan. Um, couldn't tell you exactly why as a child, mostly because he was just a giant fire, fire breathing dinosaur. But <laughs> as, uh, as I grew up with Godzilla, I came to understand him much like a lot of, uh, the movies tend to do. Uh, sure. so it wasn't until, I don't know, as I got older, where I actually understood the metaphor between behind Godzilla and the fear of the atomic bomb. And after the uh, devastation of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, uh, mm. <clears throat> after the war, and how how Godzilla was basically just a sort of reactionary uh, film to that because it like even the creature itself uh, the skin on Godzilla's costume was supposed to represent the burns of a uh, post Hiroshima or Nagasaki victim. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and even the beginning of that movie, the sinking of the I think it's the Hiroshi Maru. Uh, 
uh, was it an mm. actual thing that took place and it, it was next to a bombing site where americans were testing a new bomb mm. uh, <clears throat> uh off the coast of uh, japan i believe and uh that bomb was basically hit by the uh, by the radioactive waves and everyone on board basically got radiation poisoning and succumbed to it and so it's wow. like the beginning of Gojira 1954 is uh, basically sort of retelling that, but instead of uh, an actual bomb, it's Godzilla this time. Um, and just the scare from uh, that led to <clears throat> just, just a God, like the next 50, 60 years of uh, mm. giant monster movies. And even not only did it, uh, and Godzilla was honestly also, uh, inspired by the beast from 20,000 fathoms which came out in 53 here in the states because yeah it, i remember i remember hearing about that yeah which is uh you know like one of the probably one of the biggest uh monster movies of that time as well because it was like ray harryhausen's kind of uh his hit with his stop motion animation uh, uh, and it's also like kind of in because he had ahead. he worked he, uh, I, I was just gonna say i he had he had worked with the uh king kong animator willis o'brien right. prior to that right okay right just making, just but like sure. i don't i don't think he on. took like full-on uh credit for those effects as much as he did like you know 20 million miles to earth uh uh jason of the argonauts and mm -hmm. he's from Twenty Thousand fathoms uh those are quite essentially like ray harry housing it's kind of like the roger corman kind of stuff it's like oh roger yeah. corman was just like a producer on this but you can still recognize like even his a Roger Corman influenced movie mm -hmm. um, or produced, but yeah. So the giant monster movies of that era just sprung up out of nowhere. Uh, yeah. So you had Gojira based from 20,000 fathoms them. Uh, it came from beneath the sea, which is another one, one of my favorites because mm -hmm. it's just a giant octopus that got hit by an atomic bomb. So it just started destroying cities. Um, uh, Goro, which was another, uh, which was a uh, South Korean uh, monster movie, um, and so it goes from there. Uh, but <clears throat> for probably the biggest, most influential of the monster genre, would be Gojira. So, so during, so we talked about you know during the fifties how the subgenres of sci-fi sprang out, and there you know there started to be more than just one or two. So you know outside of the the kaiju genre itself uh, being one. The other one being one that I personally enjoyed a lot was, um, you know, it, it was the human, not necessarily human mutation, but it was more, fo that's more, a little more, a little more so social commentary for the American society was the, the alien ones, the day the earth is still invasion of the body snatchers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one that they said kind of had a bridled veil of, um, critiquing McCarthyism and stuff and being like, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if these people are out there, they're not trying to ruin our country. Um, but you know, who knows, but I, I guess why, what, why to you, why was the the kaiju genre, why was that more influential? Um, or why did it, why were you more attracted to it than, I guess, the alien genre? Because nowadays, you know, um, I think the, the kaiju or giant monster fad, I guess, has kind of kind of gone away. Like, like we kind of made that comeback with Godzilla in 2000 or Pacific Rim in the early 20 teens. Um, Cloverfield. Clo uh, yeah, Cloverfield. Yeah, Cloverfield. Yeah. yeah, that's another good one. Um, you know, compared to the the alien genre, which really has taken off and now really almost created a separate genre that's as big as the entire science fiction mm -hmm. genre, you know, based off, you know, the alien series and, you know, the vast tons that there are. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess why, uh, why, why do you, it sounds like you enjoy those ones a little bit more. Why is that? Yeah, so uh, mostly I love man versus nature type films. I like it when okay. the Earth itself is reactioning or reacting to the things we're doing to it. So mm -hmm. very much is, that's why. An I environmental love it. type film yeah. even itself, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love it when our Earth fights back against us. Um, I like, I like, I like it when, man humans are the ants uh, okay to else. like i love existential um and even like cosmic horror like lovecraft uh okay that's basically like showing you that oh yeah we're nothing but specks on you know on the ground we're just nothing but dirt uh compared to the greater cosmos and so like you 
that's one thing I love about Lovecraft. So you get that blend of both alien and kaiju because you have your Cthulhu's, you have all your uh, mm-hmm. elder gods and stuff in there. But specifically, like Godzilla, it was showing us that there are things that are that are bigger than us. That are things that we cannot control, and that is basically nature. Like Godzilla is a hurricane. Godzilla is a tornado. It is something we are trying to understand, but we cannot control. Uh, we can right. only predict where it might go, but we can't actually see where it actually will go. Um, and that's one of the fascinating parts about it. It's just like it's a creature. It does what it wants. Uh, and we have no, uh, like, it will do anything to either destroy us or uh-huh. uh, it could help us in some situations. But we are nothing. Uh, we are not even considered, uh, you know, uh, specs on its radar pretty much. As a, opposed to the monster genre, right. uh, you also have the, 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 as you were saying, the the exploratory, the 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 science of uh, space flight it right. takes off, and then moving into the '60s, um, we even have more of that as people are sort of exploring space, and mm-hmm. you kind of come up to the first real uh, major. Uh, TV show like Star Trek from 1966 that is all based about the <sighs> exploration of space, um, which really explores humanity. Oh yeah, so yeah. I yeah. knew we were going to get to this at some point. Yeah. Gary is. I've been waiting. The, Gary is patiently. the antithesis of a Trekkie. So yeah. Gary, can please continue? I didn't mean to <laughs> interrupt. <laughs> yeah. So Star Trek 1966. You. you I have don't know. Sci- can you explain it? Okay, well, it's a TV show that came out, um, and it, it involves you know people going out into space and getting in these scenarios. And oh, Star Wars! No, no, I love Star Wars. No, oh yeah, with the no. cute little the teddy bears no. and the short green guy that that says everything backwards. Yeah, no, I love him. No, but like so the original Star Trek, the one with Captain Kirk. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, it, James Tiberius Kirk. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Um, you, you, what was cool about Star Trek was that you had it. It was a morality play in each episode because you went from place to place as they were going about adventuring, and it was able to talk about aspects of humanity and how the crew of the Enterprise responded to those. The the same way that a lot of the monster movies kind of talk about aspects of humanity. You know, Godzilla talks about, you know, the destruction of, you know, the destructive nature of humanity. Star Trek talks about, you know, sometimes being, you know, you know, having adversarial things with, you know, with the Klingons or the Romulans that they'd have mm-hmm. and how to get past that. And that, of course, was a setup for the the Cold War, which was, you know, really big in the 1960s. You know, it was, you had the United States and the Soviet Union that were at odds with each other. So you could kind of really show that in a dramatic fashion in sort of the space adventure. Yeah. You know, it's it's fun. It's really cool too. The fact that we're on episode six now, and we can go back and talk about we did the nineteen sixties decade we did. podcast, we did. and that actually really does feed into this really well because after the gigantic explosion of those, you know, those six to eight new sh- subgenres of sci fi we talked about in the fifties, the nineteen sixties saw relatively little success with science fiction films, right? Because TV had become so more, you know, it was so so much more prevalent. Mm-hmm. Like it was, you know, ha- like we had mentioned before, half of every residency in America had a TV set, you know, whether it be black and white or color later on in the late in the late in the 60s, early 70s. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you you had a few that stuck out. You had, you know, H.G. Wells had his, the, they had the time machine, you know, they had um, uh, the late 60s had 2001 A Space Odyssey, you right. had uh, uh, Planet of the Apes. But really past that, you know, the, the 60s was just kind of, you know, they that was the rise of the indie film at that mm-hmm. point. You know, dir- you know, directors like we talked about Kubrick and and Hitchcock. You know, you saw the rise of horror, and we'll get into that in a later podcast and psychological thrillers at that point. Um, so I guess outside it was the right of right time for kaiju movies too. You know, because you had you know Godzilla versus King Kong, Ghidorah, three headed monster. <laughs> Godzilla versus Ghidorah. I was wondering well, when I you were going to chime in with something about that. I'm just saying there was a lot of Godzillas during this time. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm sure. I'm sure there were. I just. Yeah. I'm. I know. I'm, I'm sure there were. I. I have not personally seen those. I've. I've just seen a couple of the the original ones that that you had talked about. Um. And what what so was I, interesting was Star Trek, the original series. It was. It only ran for you know three seasons because mm-hmm. it got canceled. Um. You know because it came about at the end of the decade when, as we talked about in the '60s, there was a lot of fundamental changes going on in the United States. Um, and around the world. Right. And, you know, 
because if you watch the original series, you'll see uh, like when the budget for the show dries up because the sets get a lot cheaper right. and they get a lot more contained. Yeah. So yeah. even though we look back on it now and you know see how great it was uh, at the time, it wasn't even sustainable. Yeah. So I guess so. Jacob, question to you then: compared compared to the original kaiju's that had been made, you know, in the fifties and stuff, these these sequels and the trequels and stuff that you're referring to, where did they where did they hold up? I guess you know when when comparing them was could you no, were they noticeably cheaper? Like the production value? Like were the storylines were they much worse? Like how did oh, they yeah, definitely. keep it going? Uh, okay. So during this time, that's when Godzilla basically became a superhero. And the children are cheering him on because he used to be, you know, just like a huge metaphor for uh, like the nuclear holocaust. But during sure. the time, he was actually just like applauded by children. I mean, this is like this is the Godzilla I kind of uh, fell in love with as a kid because he was like saving the world, uh, beating up monsters. Um, and then same with Gamera. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Gamera, but the uh, Not giant flying turtle from outer space originally. Mm. And he would spin around like a flying saucer, but all of his movies were on an even cheaper level than Toho's Godzilla's. And those were like some of the most like, like super low budget, kind of cringy, but still kind of fun, like even cheaper than maybe like modern day Power Rangers kind of, or even like (laughs) early 90s Power Rangers. Sure. Uh, But they're fun to watch. I mean, Mystery Science Theater 3000 has covered a lot of those Gamera movies. Um, I think the only noticeably terrible Godzilla movie during this time is uh, Godzilla's Revenge, a- a.k.a. All Monsters Attack, which is basically just like a kind of clip show movie. Uh, mm. Also directed by original uh, Gojira director Ashiro Honda, which was also kind of just a metaphor for bullying and stuff. It was like one giant PSA, um, but it was like nothing but clips of earlier Godzilla movies just crammed into one movie and... I think it's one of the worst movies, but there are a lot of defenders of it, which I found out, which blew my mind. But yeah, during this time, they were super silly. Uh, they weren't serious at all. They kind of just uh, like shied away from what Godzilla previously was. Right, yeah. and kind of going along with that, you've got you know the the sillier and the cheaper end with like you know the Godzilla movies and you know Star Trek at the end of its run, mm-hmm. and then you've got like the really high end like. Um, 2001 a space odyssey which really pushes the 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 boundaries and it looks good and it's clean and so really the the sci-fi genre was just kind of going all over because you couldn't you know you had high end uh high budget and then low end low budget yeah and 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 that actually good segue into the 70s at that point um because you see you see a a trending theme where people are more interested in the space adventure starting with 2001 a space odyssey um and now we get into an era where i think the majority of all of our listeners are going to start recognizing a lot of these movies more so uh than the old ones because the 70s was another explosion of of space adventure theme you know um there was close encounters of the third kind you had a Clockwork Orange, you know, you had the uh, Westworld, you had the sequel to Planet of the Apes, uh, Alien in 79. But I think the biggest one, which everybody here can comment on, was uh, the introduction to Star Wars, you know, A yeah, New Hope yeah. coming out um, at that point. And talk about, honestly, if you look at it between Star Wars and I would also say Close Encounters of the Third Kind even, the special effects in both of those films I, I, even today, I think they still hold up. Uh, honestly, I really do. Well, I, I'm, like yeah, we were talking about CGI uh, Jabba the Hutt scene. It's real good. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, the, the remake. Yeah, but we like, don't talk about that one, Jacob. But like Star oh, Wars. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah St- Star Wars <laughs> didn't really look as good as uh, 2001, and we talked about that before in terms of the 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 effects of it like 2001 you know really held up and they used a lot of you know models that were very precise but star wars um, and granted they were trying to do different types of effects that they couldn't really do uh, you know with actual things so they had to try and you know you know do they couldn't do map paintings for it they had to kind of create new models uh, but it just it didn't look as good as it did eventually when they remade it Right. Less, uh, of course, taking out the job of the hut scene because that's just stupid. Yeah, and I mean during during the seventies, one as we've always said mm-hmm. that there is always comparison between uh, societal culture and climate and Hollywood mm-hmm. and whatever is hot, whatever is 
plaguing the people's minds and, you know, tickling their fancies, those two things, Hollywood is going to jump on it every single time and they're going to pound it into the ground because that's in people back of people's mind it's in their subconscious and that's when it's going to what's going to be making money you know i mean you know we're talking about towards the end of the cold war or mm-hmm. in the middle of the cold war really yeah. at that point um and we're um so when was the landing on the moon was the 69 60s, 69 yeah so we're right there at the turn of the century so seeing these space exploration films and these space adventure films yeah um it, it made a lot of sense why they were you know why would they it was you know, so prevalent at yeah, the time. And, and you know, like Star Wars, you, you have a lot of throwbacks to, uh, like, Flash Gordon, those types of serials that right. were earlier sci-fi, you know, pictures, because, I mean, the opening crawl of Star Wars is ripped right out of Flash Gordon, right. you know, and uh, the, the, you see so many uh, elements that inspire Star Wars, and I'm sure we'll have a podcast dedicated more to Star Wars at, a, at another time. But Knowing, uh, knowing you and yeah. our group of friends will have to. Well, also... Like uh, in, in the beginning, we were kind of harping on fantasy as a genre compared to right. science fiction, but Star Wars is fantasy. Like it is a blend of both science fiction it's a good and combo. fantasy. It is a space opera, uh, and right. kind of like it's one of a kind because it is very much like space wizards fighting each other. There's literal magic. Um, it's nothing but good and bad. There's really barely in between, except for you know the regular bounty hunters, and it's yeah. very there's no gray area. Yeah. And I mean, it's also heavily influenced by, you know, like uh, uh, Kira Kurosawa's uh, Hidden Fortress and even some of those yeah, in the Flash Gordon serials and stuff like that. But um, it is it is kind of crazy because it's like it is science fiction, but it's also very, very fantasy. Yeah. And you get a lot of blending of the genres. I, I agree to that, Jacob, because there's so much, you know, it's a classic story of. You know, a young man goes out on his quest, finds uh, two, you know, a couple of friends to go with him, has an older teacher that uh, he loses at some point and kind of gives him guidance to in order to defeat, defeat the bad guy. Mm. Which, if you just look at Star Wars as the 1977 movie only, it, it much more held to that than it has in recent decades. One might say that it reminds you of a D&D campaign. Or a hero's journey. Dun, yes. Dun, dun, bum, 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 bum. Are, are, are you telling me that George Lucas isn't a brilliant uh, writer who just came up with a totally new genre by himself? No, it's more like no, no. not he at had all. Really great influences. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. had a lot of great influence, just like every writer in the history of ever. Not the first writer. <laughs> not Tommy Wiseau. Oh, not Tommy Wiseau. Tommy Wiseau <laughs> is a visionary and a creative <laughs> gem. <laughs> <laughs> he is the Shakespeare of cinema post 2000. Oh God. Um, we'll have a complete podcast dedicated to the room and Jacob, you're more than welcome to come back for that one. I mean, um, the room yeah. is really well, the citizen Kane of movies. I would say. Well, citizen and- Kane is overrated <laughs> as fuck. I'm just, we'll get into that later, but and, oh, star Wars kind of hit like it kind of hit that sweet spot for everyone. Cause it not only was it blending like those, those two big genres, but also the seventies were kind of a downer. Um, I mean, like, just like they were just the action movies at that time were like Death Wish. They were just like the most like sour, <laughs> like fucked up movies, like the dramas or Taxi Driver. It was just like all nothing but bummer movies, even sci fi at that time. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, like the ending of that is super ambiguous because it's right. like, oh, yeah, the aliens did take over the world. Uh, Planet of the Apes, aliens took over the world. Westworld, the machines took over the world. Yeah, it's just it's nothing but just like downer endings, which I love personally, but I get Same. like you're just being fed that for so long. I mean, uh, ignoring. Yeah. So uh, you're being fed that for so long up until Star Wars. And suddenly you're like you're like because there's like there's hope. And I mean, it's I mean, they literally renamed it a new hope at some point. But at the same time, for that time period, it was a new hope. Should we talk about the right. Star Wars Christmas special? No. Also oh, came dear out. God, no. We don't need to talk about the Star Wars Christmas. Okay. That can be saved for the Star Wars okay. podcast, okay? How about that? <laughs> All right. Or the couple. Stir, whip, whip, stir, stir. All whip. right, I'm, I, I'm moving on. <laughs> well, due to the... Uh, due to the uh, the the crossover finally that uh, because it seemed as we had talked about but prior to 1960 really prior to 1970 it didn't seem like genres really they didn't cross over very often they didn't meld together very well um and then yeah you started to see that in the 70s and so because of the the success that the 70s had had at the box office especially with 
Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Star Wars in particular, uh, the 1980s, you saw production companies and Hollywood start taking much larger gambles and huger risks, uh, and they started upping that production value mm-hmm. again. Um, didn't Star Trek at the very end of the 70s got its first yeah, picture, so, right? Yeah, so Star Trek, the motion picture, came out in 79, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, and it was uh, heavily influenced by 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yeah. A lot of people haven't seen this one, but it's it's a much different pace than the movies the other movies are and then in the 80s uh coming into that decade you have the best star trek movie which is the wrath of khan agreed yeah and outside of the newest no, ones that jj all, all the new did, star trek is chris shit. pine is it, the no. best captain all Kirk, of the new star trek is shit don't watch any of it don't watch anything after Gary. enterprise it's terrible so aggressive i know it, God, it's, it's almost like when i was all... talking about reality Gary, trash Gary, TV. Gary, i got to hear what are your thoughts on picard uh picard is uh are you talking about the character no, no, no. or the new series? That the just came Star out? Trek Picard is oh, a series. pointless bit of garbage that should not uh, have ever been made. Did you watch it? I did you watch I, any of the episodes? I haven't watched all the episodes, but I have read reviews well, on I, it. I think that it's unfair of you to make I, those claims if you I haven't seen it. I don't think I'm going to pay yeah, CBS uh, any money. Yeah, I watched uh, Red Letter Media. I hate to plug them. They, they, they had just, a great they, review on that. Yeah, they just had like an hour and a half review on it. And I haven't watched it yet, but I was interested. Now I'm really not. Uh, I, I would recommend the Red Letter Media review of it, but I wouldn't recommend the actual show, so there you go on that one. Yeah. Shout out to to Mike and Rich. Rich Evans. I do uh, love... I do really enjoy the 2009 Star Trek by Abrams, though. Uh, I also just think it's creatively interesting going with uh, different timelines and stuff while keeping the original timeline as it was. I agree, Jacob. Very well put. Gary, what do you think? Uh, I, I think all of the Star Treks that have been made uh, <laughs> are terrible that have been made in the 21st century. I think the Orville is pretty good, though. I think that's the, or- the most. The Orville is not. It, it might have been based on the Star Trek. It, it, it's Wait, the Orville but... is more Star Trekky than anything else. Okay, it may have been released in '98, but you don't talk shit about Galaxy Quest. Oh well, no! I mean, yeah, Galaxy, no, Quest, Galaxy is Quest is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. But that's about I, I, the that's about the making of the series, though. That's that's, that's, that's not... my favorite Star Trek movie, and I'm putting it in the Star Trek movie. That's not a Star Trek movie. Get that out of here. G- Galaxy Quest. Take that shit back to California. Head back west. Ga- Galaxy Quest is a fantastic movie. I don't think anybody would argue against that. I mean, First Contact <laughs> is my personal favorite of the star of the actual Star Trek movies. Really, even more than Wrath of Khan. I love Wrath of Khan, but. It's either Undiscovered Country or it's First Contact. But, okay. but that First Contact mostly because I grew up with Next Generation more so. Right. Uh, but even watching it as an adult, I really love First Contact, while like all the other Next Generation films I think are garbage. Mm-hmm. Even Generations they, with Kirk I think is pretty bad. Yeah, the the, the most Star Trek-y of the Next Generation movies uh, was Insurrection, though. Right, I yeah, would, that I one would was say, actually full-on exploration. Yeah, and, you know, they've just gone so so far downhill, it's it's really sad. <laughs> but, A moment of silence. But Tom Hardy and Nemesis, so good, you guys. No, Duh. no. Best actor in a Star Trek movie best ever. Best lips <laughs> ever. Did you say best lips? Yeah, don't you know his lips? He's got those yeah. beautiful puckers. His lips. Yeah, dude. Uh, is, we should have a reality TV show about Tom Hardy's lips. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so out. Let's get get off. Topic oh, he's wearing a mask. And mask and <laughs> and <laughs> oh God! I promise. I promise. We will have a Star Trek episode, and you guys can ramble on all day. But uh, you know, I think in the '80s we had also outside of you know star, the Star Trek movie franchise getting larger and Star Wars wrapping up. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we really started to see a lot of dystopian vision style movies at that point. You saw the beginning of, uh, you know, Mel Gibson in the Mad Max series. Um, you know, you saw a lot of stuff. You saw Blade Runner in 82. Yeah. Um, you know, we started to see, uh, we started seeing, we had Dune. talked, oh, I'm sorry. Dune. Dune. That's yeah. right. Yeah, we had Dune. Um, you know, we saw big ones, huge ones, honestly, were um, the uh, Terminator and RoboCop. Right. We started yeah. to see robots really being incorporated into sci-fi. I think in the 80s, that's where they really took off. And we were um, also seeing remakes of 50s monster we movies were. like Bob, The Thing, and The Fly. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, now, 
Correct me if I'm wrong. The one with Jeff Goldblum where he plays the fly, is that the 80s one or is that a 90s? That's the it's 80s. It's 86, yeah. I believe. That's okay. uh, David Cronenberg. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. Um, now, personally for me, during this time where we see the sci-fi movies that are particularly focusing on the dystopian, uh, excuse me, that dystopian post-apocalyptic style worlds in a lot of factors, you see the adventure genre really start to come in and collide with science sci- sci-fi movies you know we started to see it in the 70s a little mm-hmm. bit here and there um but you really start to see action and sci-fi join forces and those are where some of my favorite movies where my strongest sense of nostalgia really comes into a factor especially with um especially with uh uh thunderdome was thunderdome was 86 87 something like that i can't remember um you know, you, the second one is just so good as well i exactly yeah and i mean any any of them really you know people before everyone's obviously familiar with mel gibson doing lethal weapon or braveheart or gallipoli i'm sorry gallipoli (laughs) what women want yeah come on you know um but yeah you start you started to see that and uh, why do you guys why do you guys think that was why did we start to see the post-apocalyptic dystopian style movies you know why why were we seeing more robot uh, technology influenced films uh, around the eighties. You want to go, Gary? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in the eighties you got kind of you know people were becoming more concerned with you know the environment uh, in the late seventies. That also kind of picked up, but right. in the eighties people were you know becoming more aware of the the effects of you know people upon the the world and were thinking about long term what the possibilities of you know, advances in technology would bring. And so that came, that made several questions arise, like what about robots in the future? Will they, will they kill us as computers became more and more advanced? You got to kind of explore, you know, those, those aspects of, you know, the relationship between human beings and, and the, their, their creations. Cause when, when it, did Steve, go ahead, Jacob. And, and even our environment. Cause I mean, Mad Max is basically just also an environment right. message because it's, us depleting our resources to the point where we're just evolved into nothing but like our primordial like uh uh yeah. like instincts and hatred for one another and i mean right. they really call it the gas wars if i remember correctly right yeah, yeah that's correct so I, I guess so around that time um what what year again did steve jobs had come out with the personal computer what year had that uh i think apple released its uh, apple II in like 1984 Four, okay. yeah, 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 because that was the that was the TV commercial, right? Yeah, right, nineteen eighty four. Okay, yeah, yeah, nineteen. Yeah. yeah, I was about to say. Huh, well, we're also going <laughs> to do a side bet here, and we're going to talk about George Orwell. Um, no, but uh, <laughs> um, so so I, I guess with that, you know, as we talked about, the two social social climate and Hollywood go hand in hand. So. So yeah, I guess do you think that? I mean, it didn't seem to me. I guess I mean, hell, I, I wasn't born until eighty eight. So I guess would it have been more imperative for people to have their own personal computers? It seemed like more in the nineties. Yeah. It became com- more imperative. Like com- everybody had to have one or you couldn't, yeah. you couldn't. Get yeah. It was, yeah. It was definitely like the mid nineties before yeah. computers became just totally ubiquitous. Yeah. But, but it was, it was, it was definitely a, a topic of yeah. concern and conversation for, right. Like how, how far table. can we push this technology and what happens when we do push it? Right. Exactly. And the fear of like artificial intelligence, which I mean, basically inspired right. Terminator with Skynet taking over the world. You got war games at that time as well. It's just still the today fear. scares the hell out of me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which what? is like it's just it's like what it's another one of those like the things that we create become our ultimate destruction, kind of right. Yeah, War Games was a fantastic movie, by the way. It was a fantastic movie. Uh, so you know, mo- moving on in from that into the '90s, you know, we still, we still, we saw that resurgence of. Uh, you did we always skip over aliens alien and aliens? Because we shouldn't. <laughs> did, did we talk about those? I thought we did. No, we didn't. He's we didn't right. talk. We, okay. didn't. we we mentioned we mentioned Alien. Oh my god, seventy nine. But we didn't talk about Aliens in eighty five. This was an oversight season. on our yes. part. I think. Yeah, predator. Gonna... Yeah, predator. Oh my god, we totally eh, screwed the pooch on this. Predator two is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah Alien was 1979, I believe, yeah. 78, 79. And then Aliens was 86. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, those were, you know, movies in, in space, you know, man versus beast, that kind of thing, but also man versus man in the sense of, you know, do they work together or do they fight amongst each other, that right. kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. And just like 
also just like <clears throat> really good uh ensemble cast especially with aliens i mean True. alien one as well but obviously you have like highlights of like vasquez and hudson and hicks and even newt in aliens and those characters right. are so memorable that everyone hated alien 3 when it came out in 92 that kind of stuff yeah and it's funny that you know we when we we see these movies and we see the bigger budgets in the 80s start to uh, start to you know you see these these I guess that they become higher end films, not necessarily like they're going to be recognized by like the Oscars or something, you know, back, back in the day when the Oscars actually picked good films. Right. Yeah. Won. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that you started to see such an explosion again in the eighties because as Jacob, as you just said, not only were they getting one or two big stars to lead it, it was an ensemble. It wasn't just alien and aliens, you know, if I, go to, go to, you know what? I'm going to go to predator. I'm okay. going to say, you know, Jesse Ventura and Carl Weathers joining yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger, right. you know, like it, it just, it was, you know, I always go back to that bit from always sunny in Philadelphia where they, you know, were, were, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the series, but Mac and Dennis, the one movie they always watch over and over again is Predator because they yeah. love the Macho Man in it and they compare their own bodies to the muscular bound. They're not very muscular, though. Is that no, right? they're oh, not. Okay. Which, and, right. and it just it just shows that early on in the season that you realize Mac is gay and Dennis is probably right. still closeted for some reason. Um, I did like but, his Dennis system, though, for talking to Dennis people. System. Yeah, we'll, we'll go into that in another. Yeah, another yeah, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, you talk, the, the reason yeah. that I. Yeah, you talk about you see you see the you see these you see these larger name actors that have made a name for themselves doing other things. They start coming into the genre because there is more money involved. Finally, um, the payouts bigger, and the fact that the the broad grouping and audience, like the the avid followers, is so large at this point mm -hmm. that they're just gonna they're gonna get a they're gonna get a claim everywhere they go. Right, they're gonna have yep. a fame that was not seen from this genre. Uh, in the 70s. And granted, a lot of that helped out with, you know, with Star Wars and the first Alien. And it, it would be really interesting to kind of chart, um, like, from 1920 to present, like, the percentage of, like, followers of different genres. So, like, you know, in the, mm. the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, you know, Westerns would be a huge, huge portion Absolutely. of, like, the, the, the movies that people followed and then see it kind of, like, the Western movies really uh, fall off, you right. know, in the 70s and 80s, and then you've got sci-fi start to come up there. So it, it would be interesting to see how those trends have changed over, over the generations. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, even, like, John Carpenter's The Thing was, like, reviled by reviewers whenever it came out, but now it's hailed as one of the greatest horror science fiction movies ever made. Right. Yeah, and, and so it, the science fiction movies also started introducing a lot more violence. You know, you saw a lot you know, more blood and gore. Yeah, Alien, uh, Terminator, yeah. The Predator, uh, Robocop. Robocop. Yeah, Robocop. Robocop. What I a shoot a dick off. Fucking awesome <laughs> movie Robocop is. If you ever want to be awesome, just watch Robocop and you'll feel and then great. You'll just feel awesome. Yeah, you yeah. you will be awesome. The scene the scene in Alien where um the initial, I don't remember the exact name, the baby alien, he, you know... The chest burster? The chest burster, thank you, explodes through the guy's chest is still honestly one of the most haunting scenes in all of cinema. Mm -hmm. To this day, for me personally, I still, even watching just the scene itself, I still get the chills, I still... And, yeah. like, I never thought all the alien movies themselves were really that scary, but that scene in particular... Yeah, I, I always felt bad for Bilbo Baggins in that scene. Okay. <laughs> John Hurt? <laughs> No, well, wasn't that Ian Holm? That, Ian uh, he was the one that had John Hurt. Yeah, was John Hurt the one? Yeah, because yeah, Ian John Holm Hurt. was the robot. Oh, he was the one that had the yeah. his, his yeah, chest no, no. exploded. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ian Holmes was Ash. The yeah, Ian Holmes yeah. was Ash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. John Hurt was the was the one who the chest burster came out of. Yeah, mm. okay, but I, I always think of uh, was it Animaniacs that redid that in the nineties and yes. it, like oh, Spaceball it, did it too because like John Hurt was in Spaceball. Yeah, they did. Ash out of his chest. It's like, oh no. Not again. <laughs> and he does the hello, my baby. Maybe, hello, hello, my honey. honey hello, my ragtime rag gal. <laughs> oh, God. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, you know, going going from, you know, you see finally these, the convergence of action and the sci-fi thrillers going into one, mm -hmm. it really paved the way for, for the 90s, um, which and, really were... Like household names for directors as well. I mean, like this was very true. Or Spielberg, Lucas, Cameron, Paul Verhoeven. Like, like if you try and go back to the early '60s and '50s, like you can 
I can rarely like I love a lot of those monster movies, but I can rarely name those outside of Godzilla. Like I don't know the director right. to them or even the original War of the Worlds, but like you can e- easily talk about. Oh, Terminator was James Cameron. Oh, Star Wars was George Lucas. Uh, uh, E.T. was Spielberg. You can just go through it all. Like Total, Total Recall was also for Hoven, that kind of stuff. And yeah. Blade Runner, uh, Ridley Scott, Alien, Ridley Scott. Right. And you you see, and you, you see, yeah, exactly. You see those higher budgets transition into the 90s, which is still, as I say, my favorite decade for film, personally, in general. The 90s um, was a great decade for film. 90s was fantastic. And the 80s were too. Don't yeah. get me wrong. The 80s had a lot of classics. Um, and yeah, especially yeah. in the sci-fi genre. But, you know, with the emergence of, you know, we saw the internet, you know, the World Wide Web becoming a thing. And, you know, you, you as you guys were saying, in the mid-90s, late 90s, you see people starting, everybody had to have their own personalized computer. And, you know, Yahoo came out and, you know, started, hey, Prodigy. A- ask Jeeves. Yes. And, you know, yeah, and like you could just, you could type a question in instead of going to the library to look for the answer and you could find the answer you got mail. I'm probably you, yeah, you can you can find of the time. an answer. You it may find, not be the answer, but it may you be can find. Yeah, but you'll you know. find something. Um, you know, and so you know, we we started to see um, we started to see a lot of uh, sci-fi films that really revolved around uh, either revolved around something to do with. Um, and I'm not just referring to the Matrix in the late '90s, you know, but something that either revolved around uh, the internet or society directly. You saw a lot more sci-fi movies based in present time. Mm-hmm. You know, you saw it with Armageddon. Uh, you know, uh, a lot more disaster so. movies for sure. Just like everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like um, sci-fi, sci-fi, and env- an environmental type film, it it just goes together. Like it just happens. Yeah. And Jurassic I mean, like the, Park, maybe. Jurassic yeah, Park, Dr- Jurassic Park yeah, is the sci-fi film I think about from the sure. 90s, uh, you know, and it it again that kind of talks about the the thrill of the the creation uh, aspect of science as well as the the danger of that same thing so technology is always a neutral thing it's only what we humans choose to use it for whether it makes it good or ill so i think Jurassic Park definitely was very interesting in that and yeah, and then you kind of god and then just like us living with those choices Right. And you, you kind of that that also kind of harkens back, I think, to a lot of the the fundamental aspects of Godzilla, because Godzilla, right. in, in a sense, is a man made uh, problem that happens. Right. And just right. like the dinosaurs were like these large creatures that you can't control. But, you know, also at the same time are, you know, really stunning and visually powerful to you. Just because you could doesn't mean you should. Right. Exactly. Don't tread on me. Um, you know, and, and we saw which, still still one of my favorite, you know, Men in Black being from that time, you know, and as Jacob had as Jacob was saying and stuff, you know, you started to see those household, not only the directors, but you saw the A-list actors starting mm-hmm. to make their move. And the majority of them, they got popular because of these big ones. You know, I mean, can you name a film outside of Die Hard for Bruce Willis that was bigger for him during that that decade and a half outside of Armageddon? You know, can you name a movie? You know, can you name yeah, uh, another uh, sci-fi? But another sci-fi, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, can you can you name another movie for Will Smith? You know, outside Independence Day or Men in Black, that was as big for him. You know, in that decade. I mean, I know Fresh Prince. We Wild Wild said. West. Yeah, <laughs> Wild Wild West. Yeah, yeah. Oh, him, and, him and Kevin Klein. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Who? Oh, didn't he do? The, he did the theme song for that, didn't he? He yeah. did the rap. Yeah, for that. he did. Yeah, because he also did the one for Men in Black as well. That's right. Right. Yeah, you know, I had the CD for the Wild Wild West one. It came for free when you bought the yeah. DVD. That, that's a compact <laughs> disc, which is how uh, we have to used to listen to music. Yeah, back in the day, also, it's not relive those days. I also got to give a quick shout out to one of the last great action sci-fi movies, which was uh, mm-hmm. of, of that kind of '80s '90s era, was Demolition Man with uh, Wesley oh, Snipes and, and yes. uh, Sylvester well, Stallone. Yeah, because mm-hmm. uh, that movie's never been more relevant with the uh, three seashells before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, you know, and and what's really sad is I I feel for sci-fi together at least for the next for those for the next ten years that really was the last good decade for science fiction films. I feel once we moved into the two thousands, if you really and the start and the with like action movies in general as well. I mean, I, not I'd have to agree, but yeah, sci-fi yeah. as well. Well, because it's, yeah, I mean, you look at, I mean, now granted, during the 2000s, it kind of made, like in the 60s, it made the resurgence once, once shows like, you know, you saw The Sopranos and you saw like The Breaking Bads and those shows that 
really had a lot of high budgets. Um, you started seeing sci-fi TV shows start taking over the market, um, and that we'll get to the 2010s in a second. But the 2000s, we can yeah. rush through. There isn't much to talk about, unfortunately. And um, as Johnny said, I just want to point out the Matrix would also be a sci-fi show, mm-hmm. which was Matrix probably, was the Matrix yeah. trilogy was really the only is the only sci-fi that was really any good or that was relevant in the early t- to mid 2000s, don't you think? I mean, you had like the the like the Spielberg Kubrick. Well, AI. That is AI. Um, no, but, what? No, fuck that. Get out of here. That was a horrible movie. Oh, God, well, Gary yeah, and I, I got into yeah. this the other day. I'm not, I'm not saying it's good, uh, but I love Minority Report. Mm. Uh, Minority Report then, was good. Yeah. And and then uh, you had some of the more like lower budget movies. I don't. I'm trying to think. I think Sci-Fi or Sunshine. Like, because uh, you also had like some of, the, some of the Danny Boyle early films are in there too. Uh, right. But even, like uh, Eternal Sunshine is. A really damn good movie. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. I guess that would have been a sci-fi comedy slash sci-fi drama. I guess Maybe. sci-fi romance. I guess yeah. I don't. I, yeah. I I I would say uh, we also missed another group, which would be like uh, from the you know the seventies and the eighties and the nineties would be like um, anime because they had a lot of uh, sci-fi in that group as well. There was you know right. you think of like Akira. That's probably one of the more famous animes in the United States um, that. It, you know, and talked about that as well. Yeah, but I mean, I yeah, I, I agree. I think those those decades, yeah, those were very important and critical decades for the evolution mm-hmm. of sci-fi to where, you know, it's peak almost, if you will, you know, those three. But I just think in the 2000s, I... But it was also like very obscure, like, like very obscured in the 2000s as well, because this is right. like when superhero movies were making their giant... Uh, their leap forward. Yeah, yeah so... It, 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 as well. Yeah, again, just like in the, you know, the 60s, it saw, like, the Westerns kind of go away. The 2000s, I've kind of seen sci-fi uh, diminish in a lot of yeah. ways because you have superhero movies, um, and then you've got, uh, you had war movies kind of have a resurgence in the 2000s. Um, and the return of Star Wars with the prequels in the 2000s. Well, we don't talk about those either. I'm just saying those we have to talk about them. We, we don't have to. We We can. Johnny's saying, have to. no. Gary, shut up. That's Darth Vader at the end of episode. <laughs> oh, is that? Is that yeah, what happens? Three. Okay. When he tells me he's his mother or something. Johnny's favorite movie is uh, episode two, Attack of the Clones. It, he does love that movie. It's a great movie. Yeah, I love it as much Just as I love. Sand. Yeah. sand. Yeah. <laughs> as much as I love, you know, yeah, a mole inside mm. my ass. Yeah. I, I would like to point out that Christopher Lee. Um, was in, you know, Dracula as well as, you know, movies in the 2000s. So he had a long career. Yeah. He was also, yeah, yeah, he was also in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Great guy. That's, that's, he's a great guy. In his 90s, he was in a rock band. Oh, for God's sake. Uh, Moving on here. Yeah, I I, I would, yeah, I'd agree with you, Jacob. Yeah, I think that, yeah, the 2000s definitely were, it was a time for more obscure sci-fi. It was, it was blending. Yeah, it was like you guys said, it was blending, it was blending, Comedy it was blending romance and drama with sci-fi. We hadn't really seen that a ton before, especially with the the drama portion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, especially you had mentioned Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind. I had forgotten about that. I mean, Jim Carrey and um, God, it wasn't uh, uh, who's the female? Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet. Thank you. No, it was Kate Winslet. You're right. Um, the Titanic lady. Between them and even Elijah Wood in that. You know, mm-hmm. they were. And I mean, I I mean, you could also like, yeah, that was like also blending the genres, but like Truman Show was probably, I mean, God, actually that was like '98. So disregard what I just said, but Truman <laughs> Show, I actually easily one of my favorite movies of all time. But it's also it's like very, it's much a drama comedy with sci-fi Elements. tropes, yeah. and things, but it's not, yeah, it's not. I wouldn't call it a strict sci-fi movie. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think that brings up, you know, because one of the things we were having trouble with about this topic is what is sci-fi? Because it just it blends with so many different things. It and does. I, I think, you know, because yeah, too. Yeah, cause it's it's almost more of just a setting than a genre nowadays. You think so? Yeah, because yeah. it's if you take you take horror, something that scares you. Typically. Alien. Yeah. It's right, but and then Alien, exactly. Alien or Aliens mm-hmm. is sci-fi and horror yeah. at the same time. You know, and. And then it's like you have a horror, something that scares you. You have a psychological thriller, which is typically, you know, maybe detectives chasing a serial killer or, mm-hmm. you know, something like that. And then everything else, mm-hmm. everything else is sci-fi. Yeah. You like, know? Like, seven. like seven is very much a horror movie, but it's very yeah. much 
detective thriller uh, right. war. Yeah, yeah. And so I think, especially in, in the 2000s in particular, you see more than just sci-fi joining forces. It's, it's, it's not the only genre that's, that's melding multiple genres together. And I think that's why, um, you know, we're at kind of where, you know, the 2010s have been a bit of a, uh, almost a clusterfuck of the types of movies, because I feel like movies nowadays, they don't really know what genre they are. They just uh, kind agree. of, yeah. they meld a bunch together and they're just like, Hey, I'm here's five genres. And I have a little piece of each of them. Yeah. And I'm like, some of these are interesting, but for the most part, just, you know, pick something. Yeah. And they're all <laughs> going to be rated PG-13. P- PG-13. We don't even have PG-13 anymore, barely. It's all R or PG. Uh, no, there's a ton of movies. Like, all of the Marvel movies are PG-13. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they are. Yeah. See, I just think they should have made those Marvel movies R. Honestly, I would have loved them to be R. I thought that would have been great. Oh, I mean, fantastic. Like, and we can have a whole other topic on the rating system later. Oh, we will. Don't don't you? Okay, uh, <laughs> moving on to our last our last decade here because we're running out of time. Uh, is the 2010s, um, and you know, I, I a lot of t- uh, the mainstream movies you're seeing now in particular are movies that are actually based around not non non fictional space exploration. It almost seems like you know you have movies like Interstellar, which mm-hmm. obviously went into it other universes that we don't talk about, but they kind of met aliens but didn't really oh, like yeah. i think that it was movie straight up sci-fi i think that yeah is. yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. Right. and it's good no 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 you're good i was just saying i i do think that it's like uh i mean also put christopher nolan's mm-hmm. name on anything you have everyone going after it like it's gold um but sure. but that is one of like the last few hard sci-fi movies i can think of like that that's not Astro. a crossover yeah annihilation like uh, Annihilation, yeah. Like, I even enjoyed Underwater that came out earlier this year, but, like, <clears throat> it's sci-fi, but it's also very much a monster horror movie. So, I mean, those are kind of obscure, but while Interstellar, I thought, was just straight up, like, just hard sci-fi. I mean, it even goes into, like, time paradoxes and time traveling. I was like, okay, this yeah. is the best Star Trek movie that's basically come out, except the whole love uh, transcends even gravity, and it's like, oh, okay, you lost me. Can you... No, never say that again. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and you know, be- between that and, you know, if you want to talk Chris Nolan, yeah, I mean, he is, you know, Inception was mm-hmm. another one that people would probably say is in the sci-fi yeah. genre. Um, oh, you have Prestige. Like, Prestige is yeah. very yeah. sci-fi movie. Up yeah. until, and you wouldn't even suspect it to be a sci-fi movie up until, like, the last, like, 30 minutes. Until the reveal, you know, at yeah. the end, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you know, you, you see, you don't see the typical classic sci-fis in the 2010s, you know, like you would with Interstellar being one of the few exceptions, um, that kind of thing. You know, you see a lot of, a lot of stuff that's based around more modern, realistic mm. premises. Cause, cause like, on Earth. uh, what's the one, um, with, uh, uh, Brad Pitt that we were, uh, Ad Astra? Ad Astra was okay. what Jacob was talking Ad, about, yeah. Ad Astra, yeah, it takes place in space, but I mean... The, that's only the setting. So I wouldn't say Ad Astra is a sci-fi movie at all, really, at its heart. I mean, have, Jacob, have you seen Ad Astra? No, I haven't yet. That's well, that's okay. uh, one of Reese's favorite movies of last year, and I, I still need to see it. Okay. God. But, but yeah, it, what do you think of it, Gary? You know, I, I would probably give it like a, a five and a half out of ten overall. Wow, that's not Ooh. great, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I, but like the the sci-fi was just a setting in that it wasn't okay. really a, a portion of it. Whereas you have other movies like interstellar that's the sci-fi aspect of it is, is, is much more pronounced. And then like, you've got like ex machina, um, or right. an, annihilation or the Martian or yeah, I was still uh, saying the Mar- the Martian isn't as like, it's sci-fi, but it's also very much a human story. Sure. Of him just yeah. getting like, that's it's human versus just, the yeah, elements. Yeah. It's just cast away on Mars. Right. Yeah. Without yeah, Tom but Hanks. but I think that's without I'm saying Tom I'm saying Hanks. I'm saying that without Tom Hanks you know and there's no I guess the his it rover is Wilson trapped in Interstellar <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just it's it's just the paradox of the initial story exactly. of Interstellar it's his character all over again no so I mean yeah I, I guess I was I was mentioning the Martian though to go along with Ad Astra where it's the setting is sci-fi mm-hmm. but it's not really a sci-fi yeah. movie you know, it's right more yeah, yeah. Kind of like Gravity as well 
Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I hated gravity. But another story for another day. Um, oh, cool. and so, I wasn't a huge fan of gravity either. Yeah, I just I thought it was so overrated. But I had a lot of friends who would disagree with me. Anyway, so one thing I did want to before we before we get off here is I, I did want to mention this is the time where, you know, I was talking about, you know, the Sopranos and Breaking Bad and all these really, you know, House of Cards, these really great TV shows at the end of the 20, 20, 2000s and early 20 teens, you started to see all of the money not necessarily being invested into Hollywood, but a lot of that money being invested into the streaming services. And right. you see right. HBO, Netflix, Showtime, Amazon, you see them start going the sci-fi route, but for an entire series and multiple yeah. seasons. And you see the new Westworld and uh, what are a couple other ones? Um, uh, Lost in Space on Netflix. Lost, the new Lost in Space yeah, remake. Yeah. Um, um, Mandalorian. I mean, also, right. don't, don't forget, during this time, we have the resurgence of resurgence of both Star Wars and Star Trek. Uh, yep. Not only with like the J.J. Abrams uh, Star Trek films, but you got Discovery and now even Star Trek Picard. And the same thing with Star Wars. You had the mm. resurgence with uh, Episode 7 all the way up to the final release of Episode 9. And they just finished Clone Wars on Disney Plus and, you know, Mandalorian and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. All, all those things just would have yeah. been better never made. G- Gary loves yeah. those things. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely loves just, them. Yeah. Uh, hey, Clone Wars no, is great. Okay, Cl- Clone Wars, you got me there. But they, but it also goes back and it goes, I love it when we can tie episodes together. It goes into another prior episode that we talked about where Hollywood is getting so lazy and apathetic with the screenwriting process mm-hmm. that they're recycling stories and they're just, they're, they're just they're recycling storylines, remaking the same exact movie shot mm-hmm. for shot that we've seen before, whether it's good or not. And they're just making sequels to, or prequels to movies that don't require it, right. that don't need it, you know? And so, I mean, there are some of those Star Trek and Star Wars movies. Yeah, I loved them. They were good. They were fun. Could I have lived the rest of my life without seeing them in film? Would I rather have Hollywood come out with a new, just a new story? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, well, Is that a story that needed to be told? And I think that's uh, the question you have to ask yourself. No. And then, I mean, also, what I love about the streaming services in themselves, uh, this is coming from a guy who used to collect movies, but now I'm just like, oh, I can't. What's the I don't, point? I, I don't want all that <laughs> shit in my room. Um, uh, and it's fantastic now that we can like get like all these new creators, these new writers to do like low budget TV shows and stuff like that. I mean, and then either finding them off books. I mean, even just like Alter Carbon uh, was pretty good. It was it was decent. Like I didn't hate it, but it's also nice to see like Cyberpunk at the forefront on Netflix and like hearing. Mm-hmm. people actually talk about it and like having like even though blade runner 2049 didn't like light the world on fire with everyone i love that movie um i did like it, that one as well yeah yeah but it's fun to see everyone talk about altered carbon in some ways and then even with westworld like who would have thought like uh michael crichton would still like be as topical as he was like 30 40 years ago with the original westworld movie you know right um i mean he's he, god rest his soul uh but still it's crazy to think like that movie from the 70s is now like one of the most influential shows on tv right mm-hmm. yeah and, and i th- i think what's really interesting is we have in an hour and a half we've just covered 120 years of sci-fi history yeah. an hour and a half and there's and there's so much that we excluded and there's so much that we didn't even talk about we didn't yeah. even get to talk about the back to the future yeah. trilogy you know we didn't get to, there we almost missed stuff. aliens for the love of i God. did i i and predator <laughs> i i feel i i'm i'm i i offended my own self you should you know <laughs> you offended me uh, i'm sorry <laughs> hopefully you'll come back will you come back next week maybe hopefully. we'll see okay we'll see all right pretty please uh no but you know it's what's interesting is now that we're in 2020 i wonder what the next decade is going to happen you know it seems like film really took a dive in the 2000s and then in the 20 teens it made a comeback but mainly with with remakes and the streaming yeah. services taking over and so what's going to happen in 2010 to 2030 we hear these stories about 4d and like you know how the the disney rides you know they they spray the sense into the airs and you know the the speakers are right on your headrest and you experience the thing uh as breaking the fourth wall will that become more prevalent mm-hmm. as as the decade goes on um you know will see i guess i, yeah, I don't know i don't know where we're gonna be in 10 years sequels. that's what it's gonna be man yeah <laughs> and you might be right that might be the the quintessential uh the you know it's the epitome of what sci-fi will be in the 2020s is, is yeah. maybe it's just star wars remakes yeah. or star wars new universe yeah and we kind of just glossed over also like prometheus alien covenant 
the Predator, which yeah, uh, Aliens <laughs> versus Predator. Prometheus yeah. is pretty good. I'll give you that. But I think the other ones we could we could live to. Yeah, I like Prometheus. Talk another day. Yeah, a lot of issues, but man, Alien Covenant and the Predator yeah. were such uh, yeah. downs. Don't I don't want to talk about them. Uh, I mean, oh, see him if you all if, the Terminator sequels like Genesis Scythe and Dark Fate. Yeah, Genesis. Yeah, Genesis was. Let, uh, yeah, let's just well, those didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. where's you number ten? You know, none gonna, of these happened. Yeah. They all stopped yeah. in the late nineties. And you know what? Okay. If we're talking sci-fi. I guess Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is Gary. Uh, we don't talk about too. that one. Yeah, apparently aliens in it. Okay. Oh, for God's sake. Okay. <laughs> okay, if we're gonna get into that <laughs> argument. Uh, I don't care for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but I do think it was an interesting idea to take it the alien route because it was taking place in the 50s. That's all I'm going to say. But that movie's trash. Whatever. It's, absolute, it's absolutely the worst one. I will agree uh, with you 100% on all that. All right, guys. We, we are out of time for today. Um, so before we go, though, uh, as with all of our guests, uh, Jacob, we do uh, request that you recommend one movie, uh, preferably something that has some relevance to what we've been talking about, but up to you, uh, of a film that most of our viewers, uh, listeners probably haven't heard of before. Um, and you did say that you had something in mind. So what do you recommend for our listeners this week? Uh, we kind of glossed over it, but uh, it's one of my favorite horror sci- science fiction films, uh, which is uh, David Cronenberg's The Fly from 1986. If we okay. wanted to go old, uh, I just think it's fantastic. Uh, it's a little overlooked. I do. Th- I mean, it ha- it's it's on a pedestal. It is one of the best uh, horror science fiction films, body horror. But it's also uh, just kind of one nobody really talks about when you think about like John Carpenter's The Thing. Um in comparison or Halloween, all the early like eighties movies. But I think uh, Cronenberg's The Fly is still like one of the best, uh, like tragically romantic horror movies. One of the last <laughs> ones for sure. Uh, where it's just, it's, it's nothing but a downer. Um, and it's also like, it's depressing to watch like a debilitating disease of someone you love, just watching them like kind of fall apart right in front of your eyes. Uh, which that movie really does a great job of, uh, reflecting um and then if you mm. want to kind of go uh modern day uh i just watched one on shutter called monstrum uh not okay. particularly sci-fi but it is a monster movie uh that's it's actually pretty unique it's a 16th century uh it takes place in 16th century korea uh and it's uh basically a pandemic has hit that kingdom and uh at the same time there is a giant monster loose in the woods uh it's a martial arts monster movie in 16th century Korea. And I think it's pretty great. Uh, the set design is fantastic. The costuming is wonderful. And even the effects for the creature itself are really cool. Uh, I highly doubt, I highly recommend checking it out. If, uh, if you can, if you have shutter for sure. But yeah, I really enjoyed that one. Perfect, man. Monstrum. Mount Monstrum. Okay. Well, you have to check that one out. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, I, I think yeah, I think the the monster genre is relatively close enough. So I yeah. think I yeah. think our viewers can allow it. <laughs> yeah, um, but I mean, yeah, so fly very much more sci-fi. Yeah, yes. absolutely, and yeah, that that I can attest to that. That's that's fantastic. I think a lot of people overlook it because you know Jeff Goldblum is just outside of Jurassic Park was never really considered a very serious independence dr- dramatic day. actor and and even so, outside but that was before you know independence and of course it was before Jurassic Park too um but good point Johnny yeah so never mind <laughs> <laughs> disregard everything I just said it's null and void uh anyway every anyways guys uh thanks for tuning in this week to I don't give a flick once again thanks to Jacob Johnson uh host one of the hosts of Reese and Jacob versus evil you, you can catch it. So proud. <laughs> uh, thanks, man. Uh, where can our viewers uh, catch you guys out? What is the website you're currently on? Uh, screenpunk.net. Perfect. Reese and Jacob versus Evil. Uh, for everybody here at I Don't Give a Flick, I'm Johnny Blackburn. And I'm Gary Elmore. Stay classy. <laughs>